So in this video I am going to give an overview of all the socionics intertype relation roles. I will not get into the reasoning behind these roles because I'm still rudimentary at this, but just uh, brief descriptions of each of the roles. Now my one caution is this. Socionics has never and probably will never try to make you feel good about yourself. Um, because it's trying to be very scientific and straightforward, which I greatly appreciate. But while I've found its intertype relations do apply very well to my own relationships, they feel like they focus on the negatives of every relationship, except for the dual one, which it feels like it praises a great deal. So Socionics points out typical negatives in these relationships so that people can know why certain things aren't working for them. It shouldn't be taken as an astrological pronouncement of your relationship's ultimate doom. Um, that is, this cannot restrict your free will. It only grants you more information about what's going on so that you can be more free. If I know that someone identifies closely with the ESTJ relationship, and I myself identify with the INFJ relationship, and we know that according to Socionics that is literally the worst relationship possible, according to most people. Rather than letting socionics choose for us, we use that knowledge to decide what we'll do, assuming that we find socionics valid in this instance. So, with that little introduction, I will now give a brief description of each intertype relationship. Identity relationship. This is between, say, an INFJ and an INFJ. This is the equivalent of meeting yourself. It's not usually a bad relationship, and according to researchers, it makes for the best teacher-student relationship out of all the roles because both parties unconsciously communicate information in a way that the other just naturally picks up. They can get new information across to each other and teach each other better than any other type pair could. Or even if they don't get as much information across, then the practice through teaching methods will be the most comfortable for both of them. Their psychology doesn't rub the wrong way at any point. It's smooth sailing here. The problem is when teachable information runs out, with nothing left to pass between each other, then there's nothing really to do anymore because they interact so smoothly. The personalities can't generate anything new or interesting just between themselves because there's no friction, whatever, good or bad friction. They need something outside the relationship to come in for something interesting to happen. They have all the same strengths and weaknesses, so they never push the wrong button psychologically or do anything that really offends the other or confuses them like other personalities might be able to. They pretty much make total sense to each other, and that can be very relaxing but it can also be kind of boring because nothing interesting is happening. The next is quasi-identical. So this would be between, for example, an INFJ and an INFP. These are the types with the swap to J and P usually, who so often test as each other but functionally are very different. On the outside they seem similar, such as INFJs and INFPs, but inwardly they are very different. Relationships aren't bad usually but each party always approaches things from a different alien angle, confusing the other and preventing the two types from ever really synchronizing. They never really get each other. There is always a tinge of awkwardness, but otherwise there this isn't a negative relationship. The parties often share similar interests, it's just they don't jive when talking about them. There is an advantage to this, if you'd like to think of it that way. These types actually have great trouble offending each other because they come at things from such different angles, so it's kind of hard to actually hit each other because everywhere you would think to hit just glances off of them and vice versa because you think differently. If there is offense taken, it's usually cleared up pretty quickly and things can continue as before. Then there is the mirror relationship. These are the pairs that are the most similar, uh, in my opinion, such as between the INFJ, the ENFJ, or the INFP and the ENFP. Here it's only the E and the I that is swapped. This relationship is like the identical relationship in that both parties do understand each other on a deeper level and they can be very sympathetic of each other's difficulties, yet they are not the same type and they find again and again that they still hold rather different opinions on things. Their sympathy for each other, however, frequently motivates them to try to persuade the other partly to their point of view or opinion. 
They may find the other's shifted focus leads them on silly courses of action and they want to help remedy that. But the remedy involves changing psychological preferences so it always fails. Thus they, they get along quite well and understand each other, but they can't really ever convince each other of anything. Then there is the contrary relationship. This would be between, for instance, an INFJ and an ENFP. These are very intriguing relationships, in my opinion, because while all the functions are in the same order of preference, the attitudes are all swapped between them, meaning that one personality is essentially the direct attitudinal opposite of the other. Some people have related this to the idea of functional shadow processes, although I'm, I'm not going to get into that in this video. The point is, however, that these relations are, in a nutshell, the reverse of the identical relation. While the identical relation do best when both parties have something external to exchange between each other, the contrary relationship finds they actually do better when they aren't interrupted by such external things. What they enjoy most is just plain talking, swapping ideas, exchanging insights, and giving suggestions and even advice just between the two of them. This exchange of ideas is generally very productive, but for actually making those ideas a reality, these two are better off working alone or with somebody else. They do make for good conversationalists, and I can personally attest to that. However, this relationship has a certain balance to it that both parties have to maintain. Uh, the direct interruption by a third party usually throw things out of balance. Then we have kindred relationships. These would be between, for instance, an INFJ and an INTJ. This is perhaps the best role for conversations. At least from my experience, kindred types naturally share common interests and a common method of communicating, so they can just go on and on and on about things. They are almost always interested in what each other have to say. It's really kind of remarkable. They find it exceptionally easy to discuss things with each other, taking little to no energy whatever to talk about nearly any of their ideas which they would normally keep to themselves in other circumstances. It's very much a walk around the college campus discussing philosophy kind of relationship. The main problem is that they tend to misunderstand each other's shortcomings. So sometimes in their advice, they will try to correct the other's psychological preferences in order to steer them towards the true course. Both parties respect each other a great deal and feel that they are equal, yet they will watch the other make mistakes or demonstrate some kind of weakness that throws the other party's respect into doubt. The important thing to remember here is the idea of them misunderstanding each other's shortcomings. Both parties greatly respect each other, but sometimes they begin to wonder if they really are the smarter, less valuable partner. Then there are relationships of benefit. These are asymmetrical relationships, meaning that there's technically two roles rolled into one. There's the benefactor and the beneficiary. That is, one type benefits the other. Benefit relations are termed relations of social request. That is because both parties are making social requests of each other, but of rather different kinds because it's an asymmetrical relationship. The benefactor finds the beneficiary to be an interesting individual and someone worth their time, protection, and teaching. They take them under their wing, as it were. Thus, the benefactor's social requests are of an authoritarian form. Please do this thing because this is a good moral thing and I want to teach you to do it. I am the master, you're the apprentice. They don't think that, but that's sort of the form it starts to take. Now the beneficiary does find the benefactor to be admirable in certain ways and respects them as a worthy authority that they shouldn't readily cross, if anything else. Generally, they want to help the benefactor by conforming to their requests and maybe learn something from it. The problem comes up where neither party is able or willing to fulfill the other's requests, because not fulfilling their requests naturally causes a great deal of irritation. For instance, one party constantly saying sorry all the time might irritate the other partner, so he requests of them to stop that, but he doesn't. So the only recourse each party has is to intensify or increase their requests of each other in the hopes of getting it across more clearly, which obviously does not end very well for either parties unless some kind of understanding is reached. Then there are relations of supervision. These are also asymmetrical relations. They're actually the only other kind of asymmetrical relations and are fairly similar to relations of benefit except that 
in a nutshell, these are just worse. <laughs> These are called relations of social control, and in a nutshell, they are even more dangerous, forceful, warring versions of the benefit relations. In this case, the supervisor doesn't see the supervisee as interesting really at all, but rather as someone annoyingly slow-witted who needs to be monitored in order to prevent them from doing something stupid, irritating, or even detrimental to the supervisor. They begin pointing out their mistakes and flaws, if for no other reason than because of how blatantly irritating and wrong these things seem to the supervisor, that they are, like, incredulous that anyone could do them. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's to get the idea across. The supervisee does not appreciate this kind of nitpicking, of course, and very often responds by attempting to supervise their own supervisor, as it were, by pointing out everything that the supervisor does wrong in order to show their hypocrisy. So basically, the supervisor watches the supervisee's every move, who responds by fighting back rather viciously and spitefully in that way. Unless both parties ease up and have some understanding between them, this can actually be one of the more dangerous relationships for people's mental health, as it were. Then there is the mirage relationship, which it sounds like a negative relationship, but it's actually a positive one, uh, all things considered. It's often described as very pleasant. The parties are able to communicate fluidly with each other and can even get lost in their conversations. They are able to work together and talk about the same topic with relative ease and they find it very relaxing. The difficulty that these conversations have is that they're ultimately distractions. They are leisurely and they're not much more than that. Uh, these types have trouble providing their relations um, with serious venture. They can't get the right amount of good friction to get going. These are another great conversation role, but once again, not good for serious ventures where focus and true synchronicity are needed. That is why they are called mirage relationships. The partner is a mirage that one can relax with and swap interesting ideas with, but with whom it's not really possible to work and accomplish things. Next are business relationships. These would be, for instance, between an INFJ and an ISFJ. These are healthy relations for the most part. They get along very well and find that they understand each other very well. Their psyches are of a very similar structure. However, their focus is still a bit different. These are called business relations because ultimately they get along better when they are being business-like with each other, that is to say, working on a task together. Should they attempt to discuss theory or more personal matters or interests, while they understand each other, they find a lack of interest or even just plain disagreement with each other's ideas. They have very different conceptions of how the world is, making more intimate conversations sort of difficult, but as a working team, they do very well together. The next one is semi-duality. This would be between, for instance, an INFJ and an ESFP. These are interesting relationships, because these two will find some of the smoothness and intimacy believed to be a natural part of the true dual relationship. Specifically, semi-duals are attentive to each other's problems, more genuinely than other types are able to be. A part of the reason for this is both parties find each other mysterious. They are curious about each other and want to figure the other party out, and they find them a bit alien, but all in the right ways to encourage forming a deeper relationship. The problem with semi-duals is they never really get that deeper relationship, at least not as they imagine it should be. Neither party is trying to be mysterious, so there isn't actually anything to uncover from each other. And yet both parties still feel that the other is holding something back, that they are covering something up. They have different world views, and so by being themselves, they ultimately shroud themselves from each other. Trying to figure each other out thus becomes rather exhausting, but semi-duels rarely have any open conflict and are known to reconcile very easily after a break from each other. Then there are super-ego relations. These relationships often begin as rather warm and positive with a mutual exchange of ideas that is enlightening and interesting. However, as the distance closes in the relationship, problems begin to arise. That is, the interaction between them becomes uh, competitive, if you want to use that word, or more accurately, a kind of one-upmanship game, almost as though to assert the validity or even superiority of their own way of thinking, they try to outdo each other. Things may escalate into both parties unintentionally spiting each other, that is, trying to one-up the other in a way that they themselves don't consider wrong, 
from their personality's viewpoint, but which is felt as more threatening or insulting by the other viewpoint. Then there are relationships of activity. These would be between, say, an INFJ and an ISTP. These are good relationships. They are well described by the title activity because, above all else, they are activating relationships. That is to say, at first, these relationships are invigorating for both parties, almost like finding an exercise partner who can keep perfect pace with you. This encourages both parties to close the psychological distance more and to work together more often. However, they are not as compatible as they may initially think. They have subtly and not so subtly different methods of approaching problems, and that kind of friction can exhaust each other mentally, almost like one exercise partner's insistence on a certain kind of exercise not sitting well with the other as they continue on. If unchecked, this can lead to irritation in both parties, but overall it's a good relationship. Next is conflict, the conflict relationship. This would be between an INFJ and an ESTJ, for instance. This is generally considered the worst possible interaction role. It has actually been said that having too close contact in this kind of relationship for too long can have lasting psychological effects or even neuroses. These two types are essentially the negative opposite of each other. They represent worldviews that are not only alien, but are entirely non-beneficial to the other's way of thinking. Thus, if they have to work together, they have no choice but to try to impose their own viewpoint on the other type, because they don't know any other way to work, and they can't compromise. They're at loggerheads, constantly trying to impose their methods on the other, without accepting what is imposed on themselves. When first meeting each other, they may be sympathetic, but as the distance decreases, that will quickly end and turn to irritation. They just don't work well together, and this can produce a great amount of psychological stress for both parties. Finally, we have the famous duality relationship. This would be between an INFJ and an ESTP, for instance. This role is characterized by two traits. One, a very close psychological distance or intimacy, and two, a great ease of interacting with each other. It is sometimes described how meeting one's duel can be an event of a lifetime, because it inspires aspects in each party's character that they had never expressed before. The pair may even drop out of society for a time in order to focus on just each other, and to explore themselves through interaction with each other. The curious thing in this relationship is that these parties are rather different in outlook, and when they are not actually interacting as potential friends, it's probably more likely that they might dislike or at least mistrust each other because of how different they are, for instance Gandhi and Churchill. However, when they are able to interact normally, which Gandhi and Churchill never were, you never see any pictures with them actually together, uh, it is a strange and wonderful discovery to realize that the interaction is unexpectedly smooth and invigorating. It's hard for people to describe, but as I understand it, while both parties recognize their differences on the surface, because of their more preferred functions, these differences are created because of a root structure that coincides perfectly with each other, so that the differences on the surface are entirely complementary and don't cause any friction at all. It's very interesting and unusual. So those are just brief descriptions of each of the interaction roles for Socionics. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I will do my best to answer any questions in the comments below, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.